Welcome and thank you for joining us for a powerful conversation 50 years after the Kerner Commission, the soundtrack of the struggle, using music to build the moral fusion movement. We're going to begin with a presentation by Dr. Alan Curtis, president of the Eisenhower Foundation on the Kerner Commission. Thank you to Bishop Barber and Reverend Liz for their leadership and to the Mellon Foundation for its support. In the mid-1960s, our nation experienced protests in Los Angeles, Detroit, Newark, and over 150 other American cities. In response to the protests, President Johnson formed the bipartisan National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. It was called the Kerner Commission after its chair, then Governor Ira Kerner of Illinois. The Kerner Commission concluded that the cause of the protest was white racism. Dr. King and Senator Robert Kennedy endorsed the commission's findings, and then they were assassinated. The Eisenhower Foundation recently released our 50-year update of the current commission, titled Healing Our Divided Society, and published by Temple University Press. Uh, thank you for Bishop Barber, who uh, kindly keynoted our launch event. Uh, we concluded that America has made little progress in reducing racial injustice economic inequality and poverty. In many ways, we have gone backwards. Since the Kerner Commission, for example, deep poverty, income inequality, wealth inequality, public school segregation, and mass incarceration of people of color has increased. White nationalist movements have strengthened. The pandemic has made life disproportionately worse for people of color and the truly disadvantaged. Yet we, as we have spoken around the nation, uh, we have found that the public does not, for the most part, understand that we, in fact, know a great deal about what works and that public policy needs to be based on evidence and science, not on dogma and supposition. So we need to redouble advocacy on what works in practical, common sense ways. The Poor People's Campaign is engaging such advocacy, of course, with its third reconstruction plan. It is time, I suggest, to seize the day, renegotiate the social contract, restructure basic power equation, and change the rules of the game. The goal is not to get back to normal. Normal has been the problem. In order to seize the day, we need what the current commission called new will from the American people. But how can we create new public will in our divided society? This is one of the most important questions of our time. We need to remember that when he was assassinated, Dr. King was seeking to create new will through his multiracial coalition for economic justice among the poor, the working class, and the middle class. Today, the Poor People's Campaign continues this advocacy, and so the nonprofit sector in America needs to better endorse and converge on the PPC moral fusion movement, as well as on the priorities of Black Lives Matter. The creation of new political will in America also depends on intensified advocacy for voters' rights and on honest school-based teaching of America's past that rejects sanitized happy history. For our time with you today, we want to suggest as well that new will to scale up what works can be created by the visual arts, by the performing arts, and by other cultural institutions. The Mellon Foundation and the Eisenhower Foundation are asking how the arts and the humanities can help change attitudes, change values, and change culture in America 
in directions that generate new will. Dr. King created cultural change in the 1960s, change that was amplified, visualized, and facilitated by music, by visual arts, and by advocacy through institutions like museums. The result was public sector legislation, like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. In turn, that legislation created more cultural change and still more legislation. The lesson is that culture impacts policy and policy impacts culture. We are honored then to reinforce positive cultural and institutional change with the Poor People's Campaign and to remind the American public with you of how long the dream has been deferred. We wish you Godspeed. My name is La Monique Hamilton. I am the Deputy Director of Communications for Repairs of the Breach and Digital Lead for the Poor People's Campaign, a National Call for Moral Revival. I'd like to start off the soundtrack of the struggle by thanking the Mellon Foundation, along with Alan Curtis and the Eisenhower Foundation for their support. To our panel, the Kerner Commission over 50 years ago concluded that we were two societies, one black and one white, cruelly separate and unequal and the policies needed to end the inequality and poverty raking our nation still today needed political will, essentially a movement to force the change. The moral fusion movement of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is doing just that, building a powerful movement of poor and low wealth people across racial lines to say no to poverty, no to systemic racism, no to environmental injustice and the denial of health care, no to the war economy, and no to the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. We are joined today by the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II, President of Repairs of the Breach and Co-Chair of the Poor People's Campaign, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theoro Harris, Director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary, and also the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. Yara Allen, Director of Theomusicology at Repairs of the Breach, and Sharon Rebar, Director of Cultural Arts at Cairo Center, who are co-leads of the Theomusicology and Cultural Arts of the Poor People's Campaign. We're asking all of them to dig deeper into how we have used music and culture to build the power of the poor and low wealth people across the country and change the narrative. So Reverend Barber, I'm going to start with you, um, but these, qu these questions are for everyone. How has music been used to build the moral fusion movement and why is it so important? Well, first of all, I'm gonna, let me thank you and thank all of the people, the Mellon Foundation, Eisenhower, and of course the panelists uh, who are here, and particularly um, Yara Allen and Sharon, uh, who are much more capable at, at drilling down in this because they embody it. Uh, and, and, and whenever you embody something, you're always more capable of, of, of identifying and expressing it. But having said that, there has never been a moral movement that did not have a rhythm. Sometimes, or music, sometimes it's the, the pain is so great, you have to sing it before you can say it. You have to play it. You have to play in the minor key. But then sometimes the battle is so necessary, you have to play in another key, a key that gives you courage, a key that allows and you sing in a way that allows the people to become one so that they can go out and face uh, sometimes what may be death. They sung in the Methodist church before they went across the Edmunds Betty's Bridge. Uh, and then sometimes you just have to sing as a way of enduring, uh, hold on just a little while longer. 
Um, but every movement, whether you look at when the Bible says, even when God was working, the morning stars sang together. Uh, Yara has taught me that even the spinning of the earth has a sound, has a rhythm. Um, we may not be able to hear it, but I once was looking at a program one night with, with people listening at space. Space has a sound if you can find the right uh, 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 instrumentation to hear it. Uh, when they came through the Red Sea, the first thing Miriam did was led the people in a song. When Mary heard that she would be blessed and highly favored and what that would mean, would mean to have a child that would be challenged and eventually crucified, she sang. The prophets of ancient Israel were singers. If you read um, their lyrics, they almost sound like sixth century rap artists, hip hop artists in the way in which they processed information. Jesus sang on the cross. Uh, uh, he was pulling up from the ancient Psalm, the Hallel Psalm, Psalm 111 to Psalm 118. Uh, the slave song, song. some person said that uh, the song Amazing Grace is one of the few songs that can be played with only the black keys. And they said that the writer who wrote that song, who later became an abolitionist, really picked that up from the moans and groans and the singing of the slaves that he heard in the slave ships. Um, and so singing, uh, has always been more than singing, it has indeed been theo musicology. Even our secular music has theo in it. When, when Prince talks about 1999, uh, if you look closely inside of that song, he's also referencing that which is divine. So we've had to sing the blues, we've had to sing the whole on, we've had to sing to get better. Uh, there's an ancient text in the Bible, in the book of Kings, that says before the prophets can even preach, you have to bring forth the minstrel, bring forth the singers to create a certain prophetic atmosphere. Uh, you listen to Dr. King on the March on Washington. He was singing, I have a dream. He was literally singing that sermon. And the last night that he was with us, you know, I might not get there with you, but we, as of, he was what, um, uh, Yara and I used to talk about with Aretha, he was worrying the line. He was giving, he was, he was slowing the pace and singing the speech out in a way that it, it, it penetrated the souls, the minds, and the hearts of the people. And so for us to be a moral movement, we had to have a song. Not as an addition, not as an afterthought, but literally we have to teach people how to sing the issues sing their pain, sing their power, sing their struggle, sing the battle, the battle hymn. You know, every, every, every movement has to have a moral movement, has to have a battle hymn. We won't be silent anymore. Somebody's hurting my brother, we won't be silent anymore. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on. Battle hymn. Before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. Battle hymns, battle hymns. Uh, when you're going to take up nonviolent action, you don't have the weapons of the world. You have the weapons of a spiritual warfare that are not carnal, but they are mighty. Make them hear you. Make them hear you. One of the great songs of movement. And so in every way, um, I don't know of any place in history where you attempt to have a moral movement that is going to focus on love, justice, truth, liberation, that does not make you want to sing, that does not make you want to move in rhythm, that does not make you want to carry a tune, that does not make you want to hold arms and lock hands with other people and sing until the very walls of oppression tremble because they cannot understand how in the face of such aggression and oppression, we can still say. Amen. Amen. Reverend Liz? Well, I think when it comes to the work that the Poor People's Campaign and National Call for Moral Revival has done, uh, you can see how we have come together 
uh, through and with song. Uh, you know, each of our mass meetings um, begins with and, and throughout and ends with song. Uh, each of our meetings begins with throughout and ends with song. Each of our trainings, every every event, um, and and people across the country in the 45 different coordinating committees in the states and amongst the hundreds of partner organizations, amongst the the faith leaders in our prophetic council, folks are united, um, united in our message and in this battle hymn um, that that Reverend Barbara was just referring to through through the song and songs of our movement and. Uh, you know, I, I can think of standing on the stage in, in the National Washington Mall uh, at the culmination of 40 days, the largest and most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in, in the country's history, and, and, and saying some of the words from some of the songs that, that our movement has uh, put out there. Songs like uh, by Miss Yara Allen. Um, Somebody's been hurting our people for far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. Songs like "Everybody's Got a Right to Live," you know, uh, carrying on that 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 song from the '68 Resurrection City and campaign. Songs like uh, 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 you know other other pieces of of our struggle, songs of our struggle, and and I would say some of those those words, um, and and and. You know, thousands of people would join in because this is what unites us. This is what we all understand that we're fighting to our very last breath for. And 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 again, it, it's true that throughout history, throughout that Bible, throughout our our movements, um, song has again not just decorated the struggle, not just uh, been added on or or to entertain people a little bit. It's it's what unites us. It what makes us as know what we're fighting for, and it's what keeps us going through very hard times, um, and and through victory. Um, and so, you know, in in this work, I mean, I can see nothing that has united um, leaders across all the lines that divide us across this country, geography, race, gender, sexuality, religion, but but the the song and songs of of our struggle and 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 that is is how I know also uh, you know i've I've had people come up to me and say that they want to be a part of this movement because of of the songs, because of those battle hymns, and because of the spirit. Um, that is in in that music, in that culture, and and in this movement. And so, it's it's an important, it's a vital part, um, a central core part of of the work, and um, and it's powerful. I am not afraid.
just touch on something that you just said about um, not seeing the music as something that decorates the movement, but that is actually an integral part of the movement. So um, when I asked the question to Sharon and to Yara, I'd, I'd love for y'all to talk a little bit more about um, how you make sure that people know that th that music is actually an integral part of of the movement and, and not, as Reverend Liz just so eloquently said, like not just a decoration, not just for entertainment purposes. So either one of you can jump in for that. I'll say, uh, first of all, I am very excited to be here with all of you and thank you to the sponsors. Um, so there was just so much good information already from uh, Bishop Barber and Reverend Liz. Um, I'll say, first of all, that one of the ways that we make sure people know is that, first of all, we're examples, um, both Sharon and I, when, when we step out to sing a song or to um, plan the music around an event, we are examples of how the music is supposed to, to go and where the music is supposed to go. So during the planning phase, you know, we're constantly thinking about um, how the event moves or how the action moves. And it's not a last minute decision. Now, some things do happen um, on the spot. There have been many wonderful songs that have been born you know, right there in the moment. But for the most part, we're very, um, we're, we're very serious about how the music is implemented in the movement, whether it's um, nonviolent, civil discipline, there's a whole planning around um, songs and messages of just listening to a song we like the artist, so there you go. It doesn't happen like that. We actually, we study the words of the song. We look at the artist um, and, and we match that to um, the message of the movement. We make sure that the music is always in sync with the message of the movement. And um, so it's implemented that way. I also want to say that Reverend Barbara mentioned a, a scripture early on and Reverend Liz touched on it as well. Um, in principle, and I believe in Reverend Barber um, and to the theologians, correct me if I'm wrong, but for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And those strongholds we found to be uh, personal strongholds, political strongholds, religious strongholds. Um, I clearly remember early on um, in the days of, of Moral Mondays, walking onto the grounds and having a young lady literally walk up to me and fall in my arms in tears. And she said, I was sitting blocks away at the park, listening to the music, which is another thing. We make sure the music is very well amplified. We really wanna make them hear us. This young lady heard the music and she followed it, came up to me, fell in my arms crying, saying that, she was sitting there contemplating suicide. She had already written the note. She showed me the note and said that she was in an abusive relationship and she couldn't take it anymore. But what saved her that day was the music that she heard. And she came Monday after Monday. We stayed connected. She was able to find the strength that she needed and the connections within the movement to help get her out of that situation. And so those strongholds are not always the obvious strongholds that we see, but music can seep into places like water. Like, you know, you, you see the, the ocean, but what's happening with that water in those crevices and places that we don't always notice is amazing. Yeah. We don't want war, we want justice. Justice will bring about peace. To live in a world without fear, hear us war cease, war cease. Why people are 
are dying Dying at the hands of police Why can't we live in a world without fear? Hear us war cease, war cease shared and thinking about this question of you know music as not decoration I think it's one of the power of doing music in movement and in movement spaces and drawing on a long history of the way music has been used uh, throughout social movements um, you know today I think a lot of times you know music is performed music is commercialized right it's something we consume um, and oftentimes I think people feel, you know, somewhat abstracted from that music in that as well. And there is something about bringing music back to people to be part of music, right? Anytime we do music, it's not just us up there performing it, right? It's, it's inviting everyone that's there to be part of, you know, singing and singing these songs because there are songs and where these songs come from is from these struggles, right? They're not just written because they're a catchy tune or, you know, um, you know, it's a popular song, but, but really when you listen to the words um, and, and even the sounds of, of the songs, right? They, as, you know, as Reverend Barber was evoking, they come out of those struggles, right? And so, you know, both in moments of, of times when we have to cry out and we have to mourn, but also in the times that we need to bring righteous anger or the times that we need to hold each other in, you know, in the joy of the work that we're trying to do and the belief that we know something else is possible. And so I think in all of that, you know, being able to create music together and invite people into actually, you know, being part of the music and singing these songs, whether it be in a, in a you know, a mass meeting or out on the streets, you know, that all of us have to lift our voices. Um, and as we say, you know, to create one band and one sound, like that's part of what it means to not just be kind of the decoration or alongside, but, but these are the songs that keep us going every day. Um, you know, oftentimes when we're getting ready to do an action, you know, I'll send out to our team a song that morning to just get our minds centered and, and ready um, because we need that, you know, ourselves as well as to be able to call out these messages and, and this history that stands with us in these songs, um, you know, so that others can hear it and be invited in as well. <laughs> I'm waiting by the mailbox, I say a check is coming soon. Come run and box these pain and pay a bill or two. But no more rain will come my way unless I take a stand. The U.S. Postal Service darling needs help in hand. Oh, won't you heed this message? Won't you hear my mournful cry? It's hard to keep your wits out with all this dead and dying. But hard times will come our way on this you can't lie. Unless we learn to not be full of our critical lies. Our government is doing a disservice to us all. To not deliver us the mail should be against the law. Can they 
Hey y'all, I'm here in North Carolina, mostly staying inside and not seeing too many people, but you know who I do see every day is the person that delivers my mail. Postal workers are out there on the front lines, courageously providing us a lifeline. And despite what Donald Trump says, that's no laughing matter. It's deadly serious. So I'd like to call on my senators, Richard Burr and Tom Tillis, to honor the 20,000 postal workers in North Carolina and the millions of us who depend upon them by fully funding the United States Postal Service. And I'd like to ask the rest of y'all to join me by contacting your senators to do the same. Can I say a word? Sure. Um, you know, and I think about just listening to um, uh, Yara and Sharon, you know, they are kind of the Pentecostal element of the movement. And what I mean by that is spirit. Uh, you know, to inspire doesn't just mean you make somebody happy. It means to literally put spirit in them, put courage in them, to insert. And um, in the Pentecostal movement that I grew up in, my mother's side, there was always certain people and they had to be deeply versed in the faith. They had to be people who had gone through some things and they had the, the, the credibility to sing and they were called on to set the atmosphere. You knew when they got up to sing, it was more than just a song. They knew what they were singing about. They had been through something. As somebody said, some people know the song, other people know the Savior. They say that in the tradition. And so one of the things I feel musicologists do is they set the atmosphere and they change the atmosphere. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, um, I mean, we started in Marl Mondays early on and we came into email and we brought her to Poor People's Campaign. Remember y'all people want to say, well, why has she always got to be near you? And they didn't understand that she was in that tradition Pentecost tradition where the pastor, the bishop always has his eye on the lead singer or the lead leader because that person has the authority to nod at the pastor and say, we need a song right here. Or the pastor has the authority to nod at them and say, something ain't right. We got to change this atmosphere. Or sometimes they, 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 the, the pastor can say, catch that like that testimony, catch that. And what that means is catch it and make a song out of it sometime on the, in the moment or later. It's, and, 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 and if people don't move in this, they don't understand it. You know, um, Sharon will tell you, well, she's leading or y'all are there. I want to know where both of them are. I want to know where I can see them. I want them to be able to see me. You know, a lot of times I want them close enough where I can lean over because there's so much happening you know, we, there have been times we saw stuff about to, to break off where somebody was going to act out in the wrong way. And I lean, I look at y'all and you develop these clues and he would know that means go to the mic and sing something that, that, that either cast that devil out <laughs> or covers it over. Literally. I want to make sure that folk understand that in, 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 as they think about this work. That's what Mahalia did. 
That's what um, uh, Aretha Franklin would do for Dr. King and for the movement. Mahalia wasn't there just because she had a great voice. She was there because her and Martin had a certain cook. And that's why sometimes he would call her at night and say, just, I need to hear God's voice. You know, it wasn't anything else but that. And she would say, or when she, or we wouldn't have heard I Have a Dream if it wasn't for Mahalia Jackson, who had just sung, and she knew that Martin was failing. But he wasn't failing. He was, he was being professorial, but he needed to take the people to a certain place in order for them to go back to the valleys of South Carolina, Georgia, and Alabama. So she says, what she was really saying is sing to them the dream, Martin. Mm -hmm. They need to hear that, right? <laughs> That's really what she was saying. And, and Theo Musicologists, you know, every movement and movement leaders, it, it, it was no surprise to me when I first met Liz, the second person I met was Sharon, and, and she was around, I said, mm -hmm, Liz got a little Pentecostal in her. Yeah, she, because <laughs> ain't no preacher that's up there, so ain't no moral leader not going to have somebody around them that has the song and the song of the movement. A couple other things I wanted to mention um, is that, um, you know, movements, as I said, songs sometimes set the atmosphere, songs sometimes uh, set the, they, they skip signals. You know, we sung the song so much at a certain time, make them hear you, that people knew exactly what to do when they heard the first note of make them hear you in Mall Monday. They knew automatically we're getting ready to go in, we're getting ready to face the people, get into a, a, a open up the aisles so that the people that are going to do civil disobedience, you didn't even have to say it. Nobody had to go to the mic. After we had sung that and done it two or three times, they knew that was the song. And I can remember, and then songs keep you, even when you're not, um, uh, not at a rally. You remember y'all one time we got on the plane and we both walked on the plane. And as soon as y'all got on the plane, somebody started singing. Uh, somebody, I mean, on the plane, we had to stop them, you know, cause, but it was dope. We didn't even know those folk. They knew this, they knew the music. They knew, they didn't know me, they knew her. And they started singing on the plane. And so right there, we kind of felt like we were okay. You know, like we had folks, <laughs> we had people, you know? Now we didn't know their name, but we knew their rhythm. We didn't know their name, but we knew their note, right? We didn't know their name, but we knew their lyrics. And they knew, and we knew that, the, that those notes, rhythm, and lyrics were like a three-braided braided chord that connected us. And so that day when we sat down, we were able to say,
thing I wanted to mention was that John Michael Spencer was a professor that came up with the language theomusicology. It was at Duke one time, he looked at the music and secular and, and, and sacred, and he said, and many times you can't tell where the, the points are, the stops are. But he did talk about this unique brand of Theo musicology and being able to find, to foster, and to facilitate a spiritual uh, uh, look and, and critique and and character uh through the the, the, the through the the voice of of music and so um i, I want to you know one of the things we also know that a, a field musicologist can't just be a singer you know i don't care how well they sing they can't just come sing at a moral movement because first of all they have to be a part of the movement because if they don't if they're not a part of the movement they don't know about the civil discipline they haven't get they really don't have for lack of a better word, the anointing, the character, if you will, to get up and sing. Like they just come to sing and then they're gonna leave. And Rita Franklin, I don't know if y'all seen the movie Respect, but there's a line in there where she goes to Dr. King and says, I gotta do more. She, she said, I can't just sing. I need to be more embedded in the movement. And three things and I'm gonna stop here. Um, I want to tell three quick stories. One is, you know, Theo Musicology, and I heard you mention a minute ago, Yarn, I heard Sh Sharon mention it, is, is yes, singing songs of the past and bringing them to life in the present. Yes, it's grabbing songs that already exist in the present and making them more real, but it is also finding songs and meaning in the moment. So for instance, I won't be silent anymore. I remember the night that song was born. Stokes, it was up in Stokes County. We were there in a small church and we were there fighting against cold ash poisoning. And an elderly lady was testifying. She went to the mic to testify and to tell us she was dying. But she had to speak. And she said, let me tell you that everything the scientists say that cold ash will do to you, I've experienced it. She showed us her skin. She told us about her heart condition, her hair falling out, her breathing disorders. And she said, I, I will not be here when you all win. After she testified, it was my space to get up. And I didn't have anything to say. I was just, just torn to pieces, you know. And so I looked over and said to Yara, Will you come and close us? I made a few comments, but they were, I don't even remember what they were. Will you come and close us out? And Yara got up and stood there for a minute. She said, I cannot sing what I have prepared. Let me sing what was just given to us. And that's where somebody's hurting our brothers, hurting our sisters. It's gone on far too long and we won't be silent. And when she walked over to say to that lady, it was almost as though that lady got happy to know that now a movement would carry her voice, even though she knew right quite clearly that she would no longer be with us in so many days to come. So I'll call to you, somebody's hurting my brother and it's gone on and your response is far too long. Yes, it's gone on. Far too long. It's gone on. Far too long. Somebody's hurting my brother, and it's gone on. Far too long. Now the end is, and we won't be silent anymore. We'll say that together. And, and we won't be silent anymore. OK? And so we'll try the rehearsal version, which goes. Oh, somebody's hurting my brother, 
And it's gone on far too long. Yes, it's gone on far too long. I tell you, it's gone on far too long. Oh, oh, oh somebody's hurting my brother. And it's gone on far too long. Together, and we won't be silent anymore. Now we're gonna put a little rhythm to this, okay? and others, we decided to go into the Rio Grande and have a mother who was on the, on the United States side meet her family that she had been missed, they'd been snatched from her for 16 years. And the, and the security people on the border said, we will give you the middle of the river. If you can get to the middle of the river, y'all can meet, we won't arrest either one. So we go down the steps, we step through water, that mud that's up to our knees. We're dragging ourselves, dressed in, in and you remember, Liz, we had on uh, trash bags. Shot Ron, were you there? Yeah. You were down there. Yara, you were there. You were down there. And when we got to the middle, it was almost that God said, I prepared for you an island. It was actually at Lamanique hard in the middle of that river. Wow. Literally, we were walking in mud and water, and we got to the middle. It was like dry land. I'm, I'm not lying. <laughs> You couldn't see it from the from the side. You had to get in the water and and struggle through that water and that mud. And then when you got to the middle, you could step up. The land got harder and harder, and we stepped up. And there we were in the middle of that river, standing on semi-dry ground. There was no talking we could do in that moment. Only a song. Only a song. There was talking we could do after the song. But at that moment, 
the movement had to sing. And Sharon and Yara led us in song. And then we were able to talk. There are some moments that the cadence of a talking voice does not fit only the rhythm of a singing voice. Yeah. Uh, mm. Taking a second. Because <laughs> um, Reverend Barbie, right, like, right in the spirit, um, right in the spirit of, of actually where I, where I wanted to go next and, and just really wanted to capture more of this idea of, like you said, like, catch it, like, catching the spirit, like, you know, being being in a space to to actually have the anointing, having having the experience to carry the anointing um, of it, and the fact that this has happened throughout history, um, and especially as as we um, as a movement start talking about the idea of of the third reconstruction, I'd, I'd like to talk some about how throughout history, um, especially through the first reconstruction and the second um, and the second reconstruction, musicians and theomusicologists have used, you know, have used music to capture that spirit, to capture, um, to capture that, you know, that time and that space where only a song will do. Um, I, I, I think it, it's only right that we that we start with with Yara and Sharon to to talk more about that. Me to start. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, to me, one of the the things that that brings up is, in some ways, the power that music you know builds on on that history and and is something that carries us through that history and, and teaches us from movement to movement. And so thinking about a, a particular song uh, that has a history, I think in this, in this very arc of history that you're, you're bringing up, um, you know, and it's, it's something that, you know, is carried out in both in song and, and echoed in sermons, right? Um, and it's the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in a song that Reverend what, uh, that Reverend Dr. King actually in his last sermon, you know, calls out, "Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord." Um, you know, and and that song being one that was birthed in the abolitionist movement, um, you know, and and sung by by you know both, you know, in many verses, right? It was the battle hymn of the Republic, but it also became you know a battle hymn for the for the Black Union soldiers. It became a song lifting up John Brown um, in that period, right? And it took on these different verses of that song, but to that tune. And I think your point of like that that in these moments, like right, words aren't often enough, but that tune was echoed and had power, right? In in these different communities as they started to evoke you know, that, that same spirit of the song and wrote new verses to it. But that song then continues, right, from that first reconstruction period and into the, to the second, well, and into the, the 30s even, right, when you have Solidarity Forever is birthed from that same mm -hmm. tune. Um, you know, and, and there is something about that, right? We both learn the history of our movements and see how we're connected to these same struggles while they might take different forms. But as we as we hear those words, there's something that moves us into action as well, right? And so, you know, that that song continues to to take on different shapes. And there was actually a verse and version that was written during the first Poor People's Campaign, right? Too by the welfare rights women, um, and that was that was sung and, and continued. It wasn't it hasn't become as popular probably as the Solidarity Forever version, but but again, just like what is what is embodied in in these struggles is, you know, is the need to be compelled into lifting our voices, right? And that the music gives us a space and connects us to, right? One of the songs that we sing today, um, you know, that was as a more recent uh, movement song and written by the peace poets, but it, you know, it says, I have not come here alone. Um, you know, I carry my people in my bones. And in many ways, you know, that is what songs do, right? It, it carries our struggles uh, from, 
from former years um, and, and that reconstruction period, um, you know, of, of a place that is, is calling us to be able to envision a whole different ordering of society that what is breaking through and what has carried that spirit through has been the arc of these, this music as well. Yeah. Well, also, yes, definitely, Sharon, all of that. And to, uh, for what you're saying is, uh, you know, I, I have a problem. I think I've um, expressed this several times when people say this is not your grandma movement or this is not your mama's movement. It definitely is my grandmother's movement. It is my mother's movement. and. Um, and I suspect that it will be my grandson's movement. Um, we carry those songs, those songs that were birthed at a different period of time were preserved for us. And when we receive those songs, you know, it, it's our responsibility we want to preserve them to make sure that those songs land where they're supposed to land. Um, one song that we're using right now, um, that is a prime example of that is Which Side Are You On? And this song was, was born during the Battle of Blair Mountain. Um, um, and this was like the largest labor uprising in the United States um, since the Civil War. And so when this song came from the mountains, it has specific verses um, about that battle. And as time moved on, here it is that history is not linear. I mean, we move in cycles. We move in circles and cycles. So it has pulled us back to a point where we need to lift that same song. Which side are you on? The beauty of it is that um, it has gotten a different energy uh, 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 along with the millennials who have come and embraced it and have, you know, put a little spin on it. But it is the same spirit that we sing that song in right now. Um, and so when we look throughout history, I think one of the important things is that we always know the issues. We always know the issues and that those issues come through loud and clear in the music. You know, we could probably reach up and grab um, something really catchy that would fit this period that we're in. Uh, if we're, we're talking about Senator Manchin, you know, we could make up something that does not speak specifically to uh, what he's not doing or what he's supposed to do or any of the five interlocking injustices. But when we know those issues, we can actually build music and build on music that have come through time. They've been tested in time and they are still as effective today as they were in times past. We've been put here for this time and this purpose and this season, and it is up to us to push for change, to right these egregious wrongs. Be each other's keeper.
real, serious conversation in this country, led by those that are most impacted. And I love this question of, does the Bible say anything about what nations, what Caesars are supposed to do? Because Matthew 25 says, I was hungry to the nations, not to a church, not to a charity, not to an individual. I was hungry. And what did your nation do? about this question of of the power of music throughout history and you know i i go back to where reverend barber started us in terms of these biblical songs right and i think you know what led the people out of egypt out of um pharaoh's um control was miriam and that song um and i think about the announcement of jesus um that he was going to be born to this unwed teenage mother and and the, and what happens when Mary realizes that she's going to bear this child is she goes to her her cousin her family member her movement family member and and starts singing and singing a song of transformation singing a song of of great reversal um that 
that how things are right now for her and people like her all under the control of the Roman Empire does not have to be and that with the the birth of this child and and this movement you know uh, those on high are going to be pulled down and um, sent away empty but those who have been low um, and despised and pushed out are going to be lifted up and fed with filled with good things right and and then you think throughout you know, US history, and, and we've been hearing some powerful stories. I, I think about the Southern Tenant Farmers Union um, in, uh, you know, these, these sharecroppers, black and white, um, in the rural South, uh, who, you know, <laughs> got a, a bum deal out of, of, of the time before and, and the time following them, but who organized themselves in these revivals. And, and they, they wrote their own songs and they, they organized and worshiped together. Um, and that's what united them. And that was what, you know, uh, that was, was how people came to know that they, they could organize, you know, across these lines of division, across race, you know, organize poor white people, poor black people in the rural South. Um, you know, it was through, it was through that history and through that singing. Um, and, and again, you know, some of those songs and some of these other songs that we're hearing um, in this conversation today um, are, you know, the continuation of, of that. And, and, and it's, it's true that as we, as we build this third reconstruction, as we fully address these issues of racism and, and poverty, um, of ecological de devastation, the denial of healthcare, of, of militarism, and this, this false moral narrative of, of religious nationalism from the bottom up, that, that indeed um, the way we are, we're gonna be able to do it is, is how those before us have done it, which is, is through coming together um, and organizing together and singing together and leading together and marching you know, through, through the water together and, and, and how you know, people know that we're in this movement together is, is by, um, by that long lineage of people that have come before and as Yara said, uh, uh, that will come after, um, but who will carry on, you know, this song of freedom or these songs of freedom, because um, indeed, um, that's, that's how we got to where we are. And it's, it's how we're gonna also be able to, to win. Yes. You know, Lamonique, too, the, the, the song that you write also gives the movement courage. Because sometimes when we're in the movement, I mean, we get, we get tempted to capitulate, we get tempted to co compromise. And then we go among the people and they're talking about no war, not, well, maybe a little bit of war. <laughs> so the song helps you sing yourself back to your idealism, you know, I won't be silent not anymore. Not, well, you know, we don't have to keep talking so much. No, but this, this, I, I wish that instead of praying in Congress, sometimes they would sing. They could, and they get the right song because songs literally can bring you back to your place of idealism, of courage. You know, um, uh, uh, when we say um, ain't gonna let nobody, you know, just, just, just emphatic, ain't gonna let nobody. And then you start adding on, you know, ain't gonna let no governor, ain't gonna let no racism. And what it actually does is that music helps to keep you from capitulating and compromising or, or careening in the face of, of, of obstacles. You know, my mother uh, is a musician, a, music, a, 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 a musicologist. And one day she said to me, you're, you're, that movement gonna make it, boy. And I said, what do you mean mama's gonna make it? She said, cause they can sing. Mm. <laughs> and, and I knew what she was saying at a deeper level, you know. Because I have I have seen her over life, you know, times in life when it was hard, and I would wake up and I would just hear her playing on the piano. I would, and she was singing. She would be gaining her strength, you know. When I would hear her sing, "Yes, God is real," for I can feel Him in my soul. She wasn't just singing that because there were words. Something was going on, and it was and it was called. It was pulling at her both ways. And she needed to be firm in her faith. And so she would sing herself either back to courage or she would sing herself um, uh, um, into courage. Um, and so the, the music is, is so important 
in, in that regard. Um, but the music also is connecting. I, I never will forget when I heard the young people, which side are you on my God? They had changed it up a little bit, y'all. And I sat down with a group of them and said, y'all know y'all cousins to the white folk in Appalachia. And one of the, the kid, black kids said, no, we're not. I said, yes, you are. You know, we're not. I said, well, you're singing your cousin's song. I said, did you know it was a white woman who first wrote the lyrics of that song when they were after, when the, watch this, when the police were after a husband? He said, what? I said, yeah, she was facing police brutality. The same thing you all out here marching against, police wrong, you call for police reform. Well, in the night, this woman hid her husband because the sheriff, because it's in the original song, the lyrics, he talks about the sheriff was going to beat her husband down because he was a, a, a organized and fought for the unit and the matter. And when she got him out of town, she said, which side are you on? So you that's why you can't have a Black Lives Matter movement that doesn't also connect to Appalachia. The song has already done the work that songs have done the work, songs are ahead of us often. And the rhythm of the song and the pull of the song is sometimes far ahead of us. Maybe the song can see in a way we can't see with our physical eyes. So maybe in some ways the song said, if I can get this woman to sing this song, sing me here in Appalachia, a hundred years later, I'm gonna have some black kids singing me. <laughs> in the streets in New York. And maybe if they are singing me and then some of her children are still singing me, I can bring all of them together. Mm -hmm. we, we come together on a rhythm. We come together on a note. And then, you know, I'm gonna have to, uh, my portion is gonna be over on this video, but I, cause I don't, I don't have but so long I can sit like this. And part of it, I, I, I intro with that is, you know, singing saved my life, literally. I mean, I, I remember being in the hospital and going through depression because at 30 years old, you know, I was like, God, you called me to lead movements, called me to serve movements, you called me to march, and damn it, I can't walk. What is this about? What kind of cruel joke is this of the universe? You told me to go out here and help and walk with people, and now I can't walk. And now, I'm, you know, they're talking about you're going to be in a nursing home maybe the rest of your life, 30 years old. And long, I won't go through the whole story, but there came a point that I needed to do some very therapy. But come and can you all get a piano on the wall? He said, well, what do we need that for? I said, to keep me from losing my mind and to keep me from going under. You know, you know, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. You know, that's a song too. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 they did. They found an old piano and mama came up and when she would play while they were twisting my leg and and, and doing causing more in uh, my morphine that's inside the body to flow by increasing my pain tolerance. As I cried, she would sing. We'd sing together, we'd sing in tears together. We just sang. Same way my brother died. My mother sung him out of here for three straight hours, sat at his bedside and sung him out. He said, Ma, he said to his mom, he said, there's one thing, I do not want to be on morphine. I don't want to be out of my head. I don't want to die like that. My mama said, okay, you won't, you're going to die to a song. And he, she sung three straight hours, every hymn she knew until he took his last breath. And they never had to put him on any pain medicine and that kind of thing. And, 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 and for a long time, you know, even now, uh, y'all can tell you, and you know, Sharon has been around, okay, I will say, if sometimes I say, y'all, I need a song. And what it is, is the fear and the pain, you know. But when you put prayer and song together, you know, I'm telling you, I told somebody, I went through a period of pain that if, I, you know, but for the grace of God, because if somebody had come in that moment in pain and said, here's some heroin, and if you take it, you won't hurt no more. I'm not so sure I wouldn't have said, let me try some of that. It was that bad. Mm -hmm. And it was nothing but the potency and the power uh, of music 
and prayer and the rhythms and the words of the songs that kept me clothed in a, in a, in a, in a, in a certain sense of right mind. And that, and Ray, and Ray, uh, what's her name? Reagan? Y'all know what's her name? Grace Johnson Reagan. Yeah, she talks about that in her writings, that the sanity of the movement many times was, was contingent upon the strength of the songs. So we can't stop singing. Don't let anybody take your song. And that's why there's one great text in the Bible that says God is a song in the night. Because most birds sing in the daytime. Mm -hmm. But in the movement, you've got to have a song even in the night. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. No. Keep on walking, keep on talking, walking. 
actually took us right look right into right into the next the next piece especially your your um your part about um about a song being able to see uh -huh. being able to to see um to see where we can't to see you know to see to see into the future and uh look you started out with your mama and i'm like don't start me with yes god is real because that's my song yeah. you know it's like there are some things that i may not know, there's not know. Right. that i can't go you know but but i am sure of this one thing and and if we're taking that into you know into music and and into and into, and into songs, movement and into somebody's movement, got to be able to see beyond the moment exactly. and the song can take you there yeah <laughs> so, you know so we're getting there now and we are currently currently building um this third reconstruction and there may be a place that, that we can't you know that we can't go so so Sharon, Yara, Reverend Liz, where you know, where where do you see the music being able to take us in the future as as we build this third reconstruction? Well, I think a little bit about uh, this season of action that the Poor People's Campaign just organized this summer, in the spirit of building towards this third reconstruction. And I think about you know us kicking it off with a, a powerful a march. Uh, led um, and sung uh, by women. Um, and we had dozens of theomusicologists from the different states across the country who were at the front of the march, in the middle of the march, at the back of the march. Um, and I think about us, us, you know, taking the street and not taking it until the right song was being sung by everybody. And us then, you know, having the will to, to put ourselves out there and risk arrest, um, uh, whatever it was going to take um, to make sure that our demands are heard, our, our, um, our uh, you know, our, our kind of, that, that we're able to, to, to make a noise um, and say, uh, you know, we're out here and it doesn't have to be this way and we're going to organize it. And, and I think about, you know, the whole process of that march and of that action and of, of over a hundred women, um, you know, risking arrest and, and being uh, arrested in nonviolent civil disobedience, and and then them having to process folk, and uh, you know, at, and and while people are are waiting to, you know, uh, you know, while the arrests were taking place, you have you know different women leaders singing a song over here, and then they would stop, and then. Uh, someone across uh, a little bit distance over there would start taking up the same song or maybe a different song. And, and, and then I look around and, you know, this is in Washington, D.C., right uh, near the U.S. Capitol, you know, not that many months after uh, these violent rioters, you know, tried to subvert this democracy. Some of these same police officers um, were, were, you know, fearing for their lives in, in that, um, in that uh, riot, in that uh, takeover of the Capitol, and and those same officers, multiracial, different ages, you, you could see them singing at first under their breaths, but then a little bit louder. You know the songs of our movement, and and that's what a third reconstruction being birthed into existence, um, you know, starts to look like. I mean, it looks like these powerful leaders from all across the country, you know, leading us towards what it is the kind of change it's going to take. Um, and then not just emboldening ourselves, not just empowering ourselves, not just breathing that spirit, that breath into to each other, but, but having it, you know, catch uh, the, the police officers who are having to arrest us because we broke the law, because we had to make sure our voices were heard. But, but in doing so, saying we want to be a part of this too, and, you know, we need a living wage, and 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 we need health care and and we want our voting rights to be protected and 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 so to me you know it's a little example but it's 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 part of actually what it looks like um, to actually have this third reconstruction being birthed um, and and that's indeed what what is happening and 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 so you know it it, it starts and it it's carried through with the the kind of spirit and song um, that has the power to you know again, uh, as we heard Reverend Barber say earlier, you know, have, uh, have walls tremble and have, um, 
and have people from from many different walks of life and and many different sides of a of an issue all come together and and be united and and kind of move forward together. Sharon, still let Yara go, but I'll go. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's two things just building on what Reverend Liz just shared. Um, you know, one is what does it look like for people to come together across all those different walks of life. And that doesn't just happen automatically. Um, you know, and it doesn't mean it's easy to bring all of those folks together. Um, you know, but I think there in there's a way that music makes that possible. Um, you know, it's not the only thing that makes it possible, but it is one of the components and, and a necessary piece because I think there's something that happens both quite frankly physically and like in science where our hearts actually begin to sink as we're singing and we start to breathe together right there's something transformational that happens when we can get into that space um but there's also with the spirit of that music that people i think uh, i've seen it time and time again you know be skeptical about stepping into that space fully like with their whole hearts right and and they might be there out of principle or might you know want to come in you know for their cause their issue and and they're going to be there but to really be transformed in that moment and really feel the kind of connection right that is necessary for a real fusion movement to be birthed and to be carried out you know, I do think that there's a role that the music and the way we use it, we like, like, you know, like we've said, not just one place, but in all of the different things that we do and all the ways that it is able to create the kind of space and set the tone and really hold that space, right, I think has a powerful role to play in building that kind of deep relationship and fusion that we know is so needed. The one other thing I wanted to, to say is, you know, it, it's also doesn't just happen organically. Like there is the piece of the spirit, right, that does move. But there's also the piece of, you know, when, when Reverend Liz is talking about the season of action and, and the dozens of theomusicologists that we had come together in, in Washington, D.C. and help lead that powerful moment, right, that took work to bring those folks together and to bring the intention behind how we understand music, you know, and the work that Yara and I have been doing, you know, to, to be able to reach out to other, other song leaders, right, not just singers, but like song leaders and, and people that see their role as, as organizing through the music, right, um, and, and what it means to understand the, the songs that we're bringing and to bring that kind of intentionality. And so, you know, as we look into what's going to birth this, you know, third reconstruction, the multiplying of those song leaders and this kind of intentionality too is, is another piece that, you know, will continue to be the work that we do and the work that is, is needed. All right, Ms. Yara. Yeah, and, and the other thing too, I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead. Okay. The the other piece to that, as Sharon, Sharon was talking, I was thinking about, um, and I have to applaud the movement for the many ways that we've been using, uh, that we've been very creative about um, implementing music. And one of the ways was that we didn't always wait, or we don't always wait for people to come to us. We take music into unlikely places. Like we show up, um, you know, on Instagram and, um, you know, Facebook. And, and so we use whatever the latest vehicles are to carry the music. And so now we're talking about TikTok. Let's see how that goes. And, <laughs> but, you know, we use those vehicles and we take the music outward. Um, the other thing when, when Sharon was speaking about um, that feeling, that physical thing that happens, Dr. T.V. Reed and Dr. Wyatt T. Walker talked about it as being collective effervescence, like that thing that actually physically happens um, when we're all together singing the same songs and, you know, lifting the same chants. So it's that, it's that thing, for lack of, of better words, 
um, that thing that happens when we're all together. And so I think that um, by erasing the lines of demarcation, you know, taking music into unlikely places and receiving music from places that people have never even heard about. We can take one song and put out a challenge and say, interpret this song. And it comes back with all kinds of sauces and flavors on it because it's been in Appalachia. You know, it's been down at the border. Um, it's been, you know, in the urban areas. And, and by the time the song gets back, you, you have several different versions of it. So I think if we continue to be that creative, to be inclusive and to be as diverse as the movement is, and as long as we talk about fusion movement, then the music also has to reflect that. And if we make the music continue to keep the music fusion, um, I think we're, we're gonna be okay in how we creatively um, continue to expand. Well, I just, I wanted to say thank you um, all for, for being a part of this. I, I feel, you know, I'm not just saying this because I'm a part of the movement, but I feel like the movement is in good hands. Um, I look forward to the, the music um, in the present and, and in the future. Um, and just thank you all for, for being here today. And I'm gonna stop the recording now. Some on day I'm going away. Please don't move where I lay. I work so hard all this life. Don't know the sin that gave me this life. But now I lay down, cause God gave me the right. I'm going away. I'll be back some on day. I'm going away. I'll be back some on day. I'm going away. No, please don't move where I lay.